Well, it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? I trust that you feel that way. I certainly do. I, 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 I enjoy opening up the word to people. And so that's what I get to do here, and selfishly I enjoy it. Today we're going to be examining God's word. You already knew that. In the tiny little book to the Ephesians, to the Christians who were there in Ephesus, we'll be in chapter 6, one of my, uh, my favorite chapters. In the Bible, we'll be looking at verses uh, 13 through 15. That's going to be our focus today. So if I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to go ahead and stand for the reading of God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word. As we have in the preceding weeks, we'll begin by reading verse 1 of chapter 6, and then all the way up to and including verse 15, which adds three verses, which we're going to be majoring on today. So follow along uh, with the words behind me. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the integrity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, serving with good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that Whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things in them, giving up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our str struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, Having, got, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Let's remember Isaiah's words. I, Isaiah wrote, and it's not to be forgotten, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God that will stand forever. Jesus said it, and the synoptic gospels recorded it. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Uh, those of you that have a, a sermon guide, you may be able to uh, follow along more closely if you just take a look at it now as I introduce today's message. Here's the way it goes. What's a person to do? You win one spiritual battle. You overcome some temptation. But how can you expect to win more? Does God really expect us to win all the time? If I'm so well equipped, why do I succumb to evil and temptation so often? One thing is for certain in the Christian walk, and that is that the pathway to heaven is paved with bumps. The easy, the easy way is seldom the golden way. The narrow way often pinches us severely and brings discomfort. When we examine the current state of Christianity, we honestly see bodies strewn all over the battlefield. And we think those are people that are stronger and more mature than I am or you are. What's a Christian to do? How can we really survive and thrive. Well, today my prayer is that you would be open to any lifestyle changes that God might suggest through his word. Pray that your life would be led more and more in conformity 
to his will for your life. So let's read our text for today one more time, and we'll just read the verses 13 to 15. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's pray. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight because indeed you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Now, God, we know these verses are very important for us to understand and to engage in the battle that you have us in while on earth. So help us to understand this better, even this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a look at that newer section one more time. I noticed that uh, I didn't have it up on the board behind. So, therefore... Take up the full armor of God. It's not the half of the armor. It's all of it. So that you'll be able to resist in the evil day. That's a purpose there. Resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then he repeats that. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So let's remember this struggle that we are to engage in here is a supernatural one. As verse 12 clearly tells us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And I know as I read that, some of you cringe. This is exactly where Christ wants us, in the middle of the battle. Verse 13 highlights six facts about our battle. And Paul is very specific. I've, I've written them down in your sermon outline there. He says, firstly, therefore, and I, you know this, when you see a therefore, you've got to go and find out what it's there for. And we just dealt with that last week. That means on account of this, on account of what I just told you, you are to do something. You are to, as a matter of fact, we are commanded to take up. Take up, well, take up what? Well, the full armor of God, not the half. Take it all up. Matter of fact, the the word is, is used in English is a good descriptor for this, a panoply. And a panoply is a complete or an impressive collection. And, and why should we do this? Well, that's where the purpose clause comes in, the so that, in order that, is a purpose clause. You're telling somebody what and why. And this is the rationale for the whole battle picture. And God gives us a specific empowerment, an ability to do something, he says, you will be able. In other words, you will be energized by me. You will be empowered for the task. We will be able to resist, literally to stand strong against an enemy. To resist means to stand against. In this uh, section under pulpit talk about sin and frailty, I want to put us on all equal footing here. Categorically, I can state that there is not a single person in this room that is sinless. Am I right? Then you've got to listen. You've got to listen. There is not a single person in this room, therefore, who does not have conscience qualms about something that they've done. All of us have worried about issues. All of us have been hurt by things that we've done, maybe in haste, maybe in ignorance, maybe in lust, maybe in envy, or maybe in jealousy. We're all sinners. And just 
like we can be hurt, we can also hurt others. If there's a person in the room who calls himself or herself a Christian and yet has never ever apologized to someone, quite frankly, I have reason to question your Christianity. We are hurt and we do hurt others and sin is at the root. So when I talk today about putting on the armor of God, you will make a serious, no, no, it won't even be a serious, you will make a colossal error if you think that you can pick and choose your wardrobe. In this war, Father knows best. God knows what the well-dressed Christian needs to wear in the 21st century to win battles. Let me tell you today about three pieces of God's armor. But before I do, let me remind you of a battle that you've all heard about, David and Goliath. Goliath was nine foot six inches. That's not hyperbole. He's a giant. Nine foot six inches. That's a full two feet bigger than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. That's how big that is. Uh, Using a similar height and weight measurement, you can figure out that Goliath was pushing 400 pounds. A 400 pound giant. His upper body was fitted with bronze armor that weighed over 125 pounds. Just, Just his armor was 125 pounds. His spear was 14 feet long and was fitted with bronze armor at the end of it. No, no, it was iron. It was fitted with iron at the end of it. And that iron itself, to come to a point, was 16 pounds of iron. That's what Olympians shot put, a 16-inch hunk of metal like that. That's the, well, I can't imagine it, yet it's true. Counting the tip and the wood of the spear, it was probably 30 to 35 pounds. How would you do battle with that foe? Conventional wisdom said to David that he must uh, arm himself to the teeth. Saul, who was a foot taller than all those others in Israel, thought it prudent to loan David his armor, Saul's armor. And, 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 he, and yet David does something curious. Now, he looked at that armor, he tried to put it on that came from Saul, and um, it was too bulky to maneuver in. Rob, if I've got this correct, I think that Goliath was a 50, a size 50, And David, maybe a 34 or a 36. And 14-foot pole in front of him with a big spear. Well, uh, some of you know what happened in one of Israel's uh, earlier wars with a man named Moshe Dayan. And Moshe Dayan was a, a general. And he said that David chose just the perfect strategy and equipment for this bulky and slow-footed opponent. Why did David win? He refused the conventional armament and he chose the dress and weaponry suitable for battling this unique foe. Now it's nice, it's nice that Moshe Dayan thought that that was the reason that he won, but you and I know that there was somebody else behind that. In the beginning of the Gulf War, uh, the war that was to overthrow Saddam Hussein, our troops lined up in Saudi Arabia for a war that was thought to be with chemical weaponry. They were not dressed in uh, normal fatigues. Uh, They had to be instantly prepared to don clothing 
to rival the chemical warfare that they were going to face. So let's hope and pray that, um, that these lessons aren't wasted on us. We fight an enemy whose troops are far more lethal and capable than either the Philistines or the Iraqis. Do, do you realize that? If for 60 seconds you could see their size and ranks with commander-in-chief Satan and all the generals, lieutenants, captains, legions of foot soldiers, we would be forced immediately to reject reliance upon ourselves and conventional methods, and we would run to God's armory for instruction and outfitting. Well, something like this happened in the Old Testament as Elijah said to Gehazi, his servant, when they were surrounded by Arameans. They woke up one day and they were surrounded by the opposition. And Gehazi felt it was hopeless. And Elisha showed Gehazi that he had, that God had the enemies completely surrounded. The Bible says he saw and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So God struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. The right perspective for us is to put on the armor that God has given us. Here's your choice well-equipped soldier of God or spiritual streaker. So let's go ahead and look at the first uh, weapon. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. One translation renders this with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. When you gird your loins, you wear a garment around tightly around your waist. Um, I encountered this when I traveled to the South Pacific and they had uh, a piece of cloth that they wrapped around a couple of times and then threw the leg on one side and it came back up and you tied a knot in the back and tucked it in. It's called a pareu. Uh, and this is similar. This is a, something to gird around your waist. Um, the soldier drew up the tunic, the tunic and he uh, cinched in his gear, which uh, fixed his sword, the one on his side, in place so that it wasn't impeded when he charged into battle. You may think it's ironic, uh, but in a football locker room before a game, players almost look like they're um, primping because certain pads have to be placed in a certain place, otherwise it'll hurt. And so the buddy next door comes and makes sure that that pad is placed the way it's supposed to be placed. Uh, players will assist others in putting on shoulder pads. And when you put the shoulder pads on, then you see they pound the top of them. And they want to see, is that going to cushion the shoulder blades properly? Even his teeth, they go into a mouthpiece. And he even practices, you're going to think this is odd, but he practices his snarl. Uh, it's all held in place by the belt. Paul says, truth holds spiritual armor in place and doesn't allow you to get entangled. What truth are you talking about? Well, some say it's the eternal biblical truth revealed in Scripture. Like Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In John 8, 32, later he said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In John 17, 17. But listen, folks, this is objective spiritual truth right here. Without it, we don't have a chance in the spiritual battles that come our way. Without cinching ourselves tightly about 
with the truths of Scripture, our weapons will be stripped off of us in no time. Who are some of the great spiritual warriors that you have known or heard about? Did they clutch this truth? Let me explain. Martin Luther is said to have stood contra mundum, Latin for against the world. Did you also know that Martin Luther had memorized the entire, this is just mind-blowing, the entire Bible in Latin. In the 17th century, John Wesley shocked the known world with an evangelistic power that hadn't been witnessed ever before. The movement altered the course of history in English society. John Wesley had memorized the Greek New Testament. Effective Christian warriors are belted with God's truth. But obviously, having the truth is only the first step in living the truth. Paul is saying here that a truthful character, along with the knowledge of the truth, is what holds one together during the fight. This I, I need to emphasize because truth itself and truth telling is not something that comes natural to the human race. I'll say that again. Truth itself and truth telling is not something that comes natural to the human race. We are born in lies. We traffic in lies. We are poisoned by lives. We live in an atmosphere of smoggy deception. Many who claim to be light are only darkness. Many who claim to be light in the Lord are bandits selling untruth. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about unconscious lies or hyperbole. I've had professing Christians tell me bold-faced lies. And so have you. You know you have. But even worse, they've remained stiff-necked, unrepentant, and even aggressive. One essayist calls this inherent dishonesty moral aids. And he doesn't have a reason. He has a reason for it. He says, it's an acquired immune deficiency syndrome which wears down our resistance over time and allows us to be susceptible to any old push in the end. We are raised in an atmosphere of moral aids. Think about that. In Ephesians 4.25, Paul has just finished saying, Therefore, each one of you must put, on, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now listen, those who have that belt of truth about them, they have their armor cinched tight around the objective truth of God and the subject of outworking in lives of truth. That belt of truth literally arms these people and makes it possible for them to face the enemy without flinching. As Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.19, so fight gallantly, armed with faith and a good conscience. So how have your battles been going? Do you need to tighten your belt? Gird yourself for the battle. We must fill ourselves with the truth of God's word. Then consciously submit to it so that we will be instinctively truthful. Following the belt of truth is the breastplate of righteousness. 
This was uh, generally one hammered piece of bronze, which covered the front of the body. It was fitted so that the soldier would be able to ward off and fight through the deadly thrusts from the opponent's short sword. It was to protect his heart and his vital organs. That's what righteousness does. This breastplate had two layers. Uh, First, it is God's righteousness that we're talking about. We do not uh, generate it on our own. God imputes, and this is kind of a a, a, a biggie uh, with Reformed faith. Where does that righteousness come from? God imputes this righteousness to us at salvation. And so the same hard, protective outer coating that's on the helmet of salvation is also found on this breastplate of righteousness. God's righteousness means that we accept what he did for us. Like Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are filthy rags. But then Jesus does something. He gives us his righteousness, a righteousness from God. Paul talks about receiving God's righteousness in Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But whatever things were gained to me, Paul says, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Keep in mind also, God describes this breastplate. And is this breastplate something that you can go to battle with? Is it, let me just say this, is it an offensive weapon? It's not, is it? It's not at all. We're not asking this soldier to take off the breastplate and bang somebody over the head with it. So it could be, this is defensive. What's so good about righteousness that makes righteousness defense? We can stand in the battle in the midst and not get hurt. Wow. The uh, breastplate of righteousness is received through faith. It's lived out through faith. It's lived out constantly through faith. It's been imputed to us. That means it's been given to us. And if we truly receive it, we wear it and others see it and recognize it. Once imputed to us, then it changes us. Not only is this initial righteousness, which is at salvation, but this is ongoing righteousness. Let me illustrate this by uh, borrowing from a little-known theologue, R.C. Sproul, who tells this story in his book, The Holiness of God. He tells this, uh, it's a golf story, and he was a golfer. A few years ago, one of the leading golfers on the professional tour was invited to play in a foursome with Gerald Ford, then the President of the United States, Jack Nicklaus, and Billy Graham. The golfer was especially in awe of playing with Ford and Billy Graham. He had frequently played with Nicklaus. After the round of golf was finished, one of the other pros came up to the golfer and asked, hey, what was it like playing with the President and Billy Graham? The pro unleashed a torrent of cursing, and in a disgusted manner said, I don't need Billy Graham stuffing religion down my throat. With that, he turned on his heel and stormed off, heading for the practice tee. His friend followed the angry pro to the practice tee. The pro took out his driver and started to beat the balls in a fury. His neck was crimson and and it almost looked like steam coming out of his ears. 
His friend said nothing. He sat on the bench and watched. After a few minutes, the anger of the pro was silent. He settled down. His friend said quietly, was Billy a little rough on you out there? The pro heaved an embarrassed sigh and said, no, he didn't even mention religion. I just had a bad round. You know, you're kind of thinking, that's astonishing. Billy Graham had spoken not a word about God, nothing about Jesus, nothing about religion, yet the golf pro had stormed away after the round, accusing Billy Graham of, of trying to ram religion down his throat. How can you explain that? Well, it's not really too difficult. Billy Graham didn't have to say a word. He didn't have to give a single sideward glance to make the pro feel uncomfortable. Billy Graham is so, or was, so identified with religion, so associated with the things of God, that his very presence, as stated in Proverbs, quote, is enough to smother the wicked man who flees when no man pursues. Luther was right. The pagan does tremble at the rustling of a leaf. He feels the hound of heaven breathing down his neck. He feels crowded by holiness, even if it's only made present by an imperfect, partially sanctified human vessel. Now let me ask, is that what your breastplate looks like? Or are you masking, or are you masquerading in some moth-eaten t-shirt. I've run four marathons. Every once in a while, I'm tempted to pull out one of the t-shirts that they give you as a marathon finisher. And the last time I did that, it did have moth holes in it. <laughs> it also said something like 2005. <laughs> Verse 15 tells us they had some type of shoe on and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Josephus is an early church historian. He says that these sandals were called caliga. They were open-toed leather boots with a heavy nail-studded sole. These were real nails. Uh, they were driven from the inside down to the bottom. But even the nails were angled when they were driven in and they were driven so the head was in, inside the nail in the front and it went toward the back. They weren't driven straight in. They were made for marching and marching forward. Really, they, they would uh, remind you of the football cleats of today. They provide excellent traction superb footing, so you could really dig in in the moments of hand-to-hand -hand or sword-to-sword -sword combat. This is a picture of readiness. Here's the obvious lesson. The gospel of peace is the peace that comes to us in and through the gospel, which connects us to the ground so as to make us immovable in battle. What kind of peace is this, you might ask? Well, there are two kinds, the peace with God and the peace of God. The peace with God is mentioned in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our friends and our neighbors search and search for peace. Non-Christians today search for peace. How? It's just a mirage that they're driving toward. They want maybe a bigger car, a better home, a, a better title at work. They want more money. Really, they want peace with God. This peace that's spoken of in Romans relaxes the soul and allows you to live relaxed even in the middle of the battle. I taped a boxing match uh, several months ago, and the commentator said that uh, one fighter 
would surely win because he was the most relaxed. He was able to take punches and return them, but the punches that he took, because he was relaxed, kind of moved off to the side. Now listen. Knowing that your sins have been forgiven and forgotten through Jesus Christ, in my life, that's a wow. That's peace. I remember the day I, I came to that realization. I, I began to smile. I've told you this before. A peace crossed my lips. I smiled so much that day that the smile muscles in the back of my head gave me a headache. And then peace of God, not peace with, but peace of God. Remember Jesus' words in the upper room. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Jesus, the God-man, gives us his personal peace. That's a peace that spoke so kindly that it unnerved Pilate. That's a peace that rises above the ripples in this world. No matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what move the enemy makes, your war boots of peace allow you to hold your ground. So how are we going to use this? How are we going to understand this? Um, I knew a man, uh, Gary Richmond, who was uh, on staff with Chuck Swindoll. I remember when he first came in, he had worked in a zoo for a long, long, long time. And then he was hired there. And uh, he wrote a book. It was called View from the Zoo. He tells of a mother giraffe giving birth to her young. Have any of you seen a giraffe getting born? It is brutal. <laughs> it is brutal. Um, here's the way he describes uh, that struggle at birth. The first things to emerge are the baby giraffe's front hooves and head. A few minutes later, the plucky newborn calf is hurled forth, falls 10 feet, and lands on its back. Within seconds, he rolls to an upright position with his legs tucked under his body. From this position, he considers the world for the first time and shakes off the last vestiges of birthing fluid from his eyes and ears. The mother giraffe lowers her head long enough to take a quick look. Then she positions herself directly over her calf. She waits for a minute, and then she does the most unreasonable thing. She swings her long, pendulous legs outward and kicks her baby so that it is sent sprawling head over heels. When it doesn't get up, the violent process is repeated over and over again. The struggle to rise is momentous. As the baby calf grows tired, the mother kicks it again and again to stimulate its efforts. Finally, the calf stands for the first time on its wobbly legs. Then the mother does the most remarkable thing. She kicks it off its feet again. Why? She wants it to remember how to get up. In the wild, baby giraffes must be able to get up as quickly as possible in order to stay with the herd where there is safety. Lions, hyenas, leopards, and wild hunting dogs all enjoy young giraffes for dinner. And they'd have plenty of those dinners too if the mother didn't teach her calf to get up quickly and get with it. Can you see a parallel there to your own life? I can. <laughs> There have been many, many times where it seemed that I had just stood up after a trial only to be knocked down again by the next one. Trials and struggles can come in bunches. God may be teaching us how to get up, how to walk with him, how to be less wounded in the long run, but it doesn't mean that my struggles are over. 
Have you heard the saying, the shoemaker's children have no shoes? Basically, it means that we shouldn't miss out on what is easy for us to have because of our relationship. If you are a Christian, ready yourself with truth. Truth holds everything in place. Make some big steps this week. Maybe you're going to say in your mind, I need to cease lying. Push ahead in areas of truth. Get truth in your head. How are you going to do that? Read God's word. Have you got that breastplate of righteousness snug against you? You may have claimed God's righteousness, but is it proving you a hypocrite? If it's truly his righteousness, then it permeates your weak. Is your life being brought in conformity to his will more and more each day? As you hear and read his word, what are you changing in your life? What is God commanding you to do? Do you want protection? Then put on the real breastplate but it is heavy and may cause a strain. And then stand firm in the battle with the war boots of the gospel of peace, peace with God and peace of God. Sometimes I know that the shoemaker's children have no shoes. And how do I know that? Because they keep falling down in the middle of the battle. When the going gets tough, they panic. Sometimes they even bolt. Sometimes our fellow workers find us a burden and not a blessing. If you're in a retreat mode, then reopen the lines of communication, will you? To stand in battle, communicate this. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. I trust that you know this week that God wants you to thrive in your Christian walk. And it is tough, but you can overcome. But these are not optional pieces, friends. These are essential pieces. Don't you dare think that you can pick and choose through this wardrobe. We must put on the full armor of God. It is a coordinated outfit. It only works well together. This week, may we ponder these, these points and, and pull out these pieces of clothing and begin to learn how to dress as Christians. Lord, we, we look forward to seeing what you will accomplish through your people when they're equipped the way you want them to be. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I, I do pray, pray Lord, that You'd uh, take these truths and drive them home and that in the long run we can move closer and closer to you and bring uh, a smile, so to speak, to, to your lips, bring, bring pleasure, pleasure to your eyes as your children begin to look more and more like you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.